Thank you, Duncan. Uh, now, Kyle for uh, propulsion uh, safety. Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Hieronymus, and I am with Bell's innovation team. I'm responsible for the design of the electric propulsion system for our Nexus demo aircraft. And today, it's been really interesting, a lot of really good information from um, our partners at EASA and the regulators. And it's really interesting to listen to how the new regulations and, and accepted means of compliance, I got that right, right? Accepted. Um, are structured to be as flexible as possible for the VTOL space and the eVTOL space. And I think that's really important right now as there's, what, 200 something different vehicles, that options that are out there. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach today and, and talk about some of the practical applications and issues around uh, eVTOL propulsion system safety from the perspective of a manufacturer and someone that is interested in designing a system that can actually go fly for us in our demo aircraft, in our experimental aircraft, but that will also take us forward into what we think a certified man-rated product can be. Um, in general, this is a really, really big topic, and you know, 20 minutes or 25 minutes is certainly not enough to cover all of the considerations that we are working through, but there's a couple here that I think are really key to taking the discussion about how we implement a, um, distributed electric propulsion into a VTOL aircraft into a real application and, and potentially a certified application. So I think everyone's familiar with the promise of eVTOL and specifically the application of electric propulsion into VTOL aircraft. So it was presented this morning that we need to be four times quieter and <coughs> twice as safe and 15 times more reliable and I forget all the numbers, but it's a really big challenge. And the reality is if this was all possible with existing technology, these aircraft would be flying around today and quite clearly they're not. So we have to be applying new technologies to be able to reach those types of metrics and goals. One of those is electric propulsion, and another associated to that, hand in hand, is distributed propulsion. Um, and they're really exciting. There's a lot of different ways we can use them. There's, it's very exciting about what we can do to unlock different configurations of aircraft that, that formerly weren't possible with legacy technologies. But they're not necessarily the magic bullet for everything. So like any typical engineering design, there's a trade between opportunities and challenges. I think a lot of these are pretty generic. I wanted to start with this slide though, so to sort of set the tone that, you know, the big opportunities for electric propulsion are coming up with new arrangements and architectures of vehicles that allow us to use reduced complexity of components, eliminate some critical components or some more expensive components, uh, integrate dissimilarity um, and redundancy. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, one of the major op goals for this for a commercial operator is to reduce the cost and increase the safety of the aircraft. So that comes from not only designing to a, you know, DAL A or a 10 to the minus nine aircraft, but it comes back to the operational safety, which is ease of maintenance and reduced pilot workload. I mean, both of those are key both for safety and for direct operating cost of the vehicles. So electric propulsion can do a lot for us. However, there's a lot of challenges with that. So although we're suggesting that we're reducing the complexity of components, we may actually be increasing the complexity of the systems. And that may lead to more time in complex hardware, complex software, which leads into discussions about what DAO level we end up at and how much time and effort has to go into the certification process of those systems. Um, it also comes back to weight and cost. So in theory, we're adding redundancy or potentially adding redundancy to our propulsion system in the hopes that it makes it less complex and more safe and easier to operate. However, the opposite may happen if we're not careful. We may end up actually adding weight 
if we're not careful with those systems. And that's where, at the end of the day, we have to trade these things. And there's really two considerations that I want to talk about in more detail. The first is how we handle propulsor failures. So when I say a propulsor, I'm talking about sort of generic term of either a rotor or a prop or prop rotor or whatever combination you want to, you want to consider. Um, the easy one is when we start looking at these multi-copter vehicles, imagine six rotors or more, you can look at it by inspection and say, okay, if one of them stops, or I, or I tell it to stop, <clears throat> so long as I have a remaining number in operation and they're sized appropriately, then I can either continue safe flight or, or land the aircraft. As such, we may have a target for a major hazard there, which would tag a 10 to the minus five requirement associated with those parts in that system, which with today's technology is very achievable um, for relatively simple and low cost, which is good. However, a rotor stoppage is not the only thing we have to consider. In fact, we have to consider all of the failure modes which would be associated with an FHA of the aircraft. And if any of those failure modes end up ticking a catastrophic failure mode, then that part inherently becomes, or system inherently becomes a critical part. So one easy thing to talk about is structural failure. Now, let's talk specifically of a rotor. If I have a hex, one rotor can stop, and I can land it safely if I'm sized appropriately. But if that rotor fails structurally and comes off the aircraft, there are a number of hazards that we have to account for. Uh, release of uncontained high energy debris is one of them. Cascading failures to other rotors. So if I have a rotor fail and it hits another rotor, which causes a cascading failure, now I have multiple failures that may or may not be acceptable to land the aircraft safely. <clears throat> I'm not saying that it's impossible to design around not having critical rotors. I think there are vehicle configurations that it's potentially possible to do that. However, you still have to consider these failure modes, and you would have to show and prove that those failures don't lead to catastrophic consequences. And when we're talking about six or eight rotors, or, or even less, obviously, I think it's very challenging to come up with a configuration of a vehicle, actually a real configuration of a vehicle that mitigates these failure modes. Hence, we need to consider the application of critical parts critical rotor systems, critical drive systems, which, by the way, is what our industry typically does with vertical lift aircraft today. So you have critical rotor systems and critical gearboxes, critical drives. Um, the other, of course, is looking at loss of control. So not necessarily looking at hardware itself, but looking at the control side, so the electrical hardware and software. Again, if we can identify a failure and stop that rotor, in an, in, a, in an appropriate amount of time, then we might consider it major. However, if we have a severe overspeed or a severe oscillation, which are the two that we normally consider for traditional propulsion system installations, both of those may still end up being catastrophic for an aircraft or a multi-rotor aircraft. Uh, you can think if we have an overspeed, we end up producing too much thrust and the aircraft becomes uncontrollable or if we have an oscillation, you may actually have that oscillation propagate to the other motors or the rest of the control system because that motor and propulsor is coupled to the aircraft through the airframe, right? And now you have a system that has to decide how do I, which one is bad and how do I turn it off? And if that system is wrong, it turns off the wrong propulsors, now you have a catastrophic failure. So this rolls back in to having critical systems even though you have distribution, and redundancy. So the key here is that redundancy is a very powerful tool, and I think it's important for us to use it appropriately to increase the reliability and safety, potentially, and also decrease the cost and operation of the vehicle. But it may not be the answer alone, and it has to be specifically applied to each configuration of aircraft. Now, there's, there's another really important part of this that is not necessarily a safety discussion alone, but the safety discussion actually ties us into performance 
and of the vehicle and weight of the components. So here we have a really simple case study that looks at a uh, hex aircraft in two configurations. So the configuration on the left here would be sizing those components to be redundant and non-critical such that if any single one failed, you can still land the aircraft safely. Case two considers that the rotors and combining system, when I say combining system, could be a gearbox, could be something that torque sums, could be something that speed sums, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but system that would combine the inputs of two separate systems. We consider there that the rotor is a critical part and the combining is a critical part, just like we do for traditional rotorcraft today. And that on the back side of that, the motors and motor control could be redundant and non-critical. So let's look at a little bit of the math associated to this. So consider a very basic consideration or a very basic um, <clears throat> configuration where on our hex, our center of gravity is center or our center of gravity is centered on the aircraft. We're in a hover and everything's working. So you would want inherently that the thrust on each of the rotors to be equal to each other, right? And we're going to call that a, a nominal thrust or a TN. <clears throat> now, if we consider that we offset the CG sum, and you consider maybe also maneuvering power, however you want to look at it, we'll do some really simple math and say we're going to increase the thrust on rotor number two by 20%. And we're going to decrease the thrust on rotor number five by 20%. So same net thrust on the aircraft, we're just adjusting it for center of gravity. Let's say rotor two fails. This is case one where we're considering that that entire rotor is gonna stop. And we'll assume that it didn't come apart on us and we're not considering those other critical failure modes, but it just stops. Now, I'm expecting rotor number one and number four to take the moment that was about the aircraft and handle that for me. Except, of course, we have a smaller lever arm on rotor number one and number four than we had on number two. So I essentially have to go to a 1.7 TN rating to handle that failure mode to keep the aircraft balanced. Now, the reality is this is really, really simple math. It's much more complex than this, but I want to illustrate the point. If we then look at the power required using you know, our basic momentum theory relationship, we would suggest that we would need to rate each of those motors for 2.2x the power required so that if one of them fails, we can maintain the same moment about the aircraft in hover. Again, a lot more considerations than this that go into it, but the basic math. Now, let's look at a critical rotor system with two, two motors per rotor. And we assume a single failure. One of those motors goes out. <clears throat> now what we can do is, since we didn't lose the whole rotor on number two, we can increase the power output from the remaining motor but share the load across the remaining. So I increase the power on one, four, three, and six, and the power on number two. And if I roughly balance that all out, I end up needing to go to a 1.2 thrust instead of a 1.7 thrust. And what that means for power is I end up needing a 1.3 power rating instead of a 2.2 power rating. In the big picture, that's a really big difference when we start talking about weight and cost of components. That power doesn't come for free. It doesn't come for free in the electric motor. It doesn't come for free in the distribution. It doesn't come from free in the energy storage. We're already, with any of these vehicles, only barely on the cusp of having vehicles that are light enough to perform a meaningful mission. Increasing the power by 20, 30, 50, 100 percent for these, to account for these failure modes is really not an acceptable option when it comes to looking at carrying a vehicle with payload. <clears throat> so, in a summary of this, looking at these two cases, case one being that introduces redundancy into the propulsion system all the way through the propulsor so that you have no critical rotors, case two being 
the rotor system is critical, but the propulsion system is redundant. What you end up seeing is that both of them can handle a stoppage. So case one handles it with redundancy. Case two, you don't stop the rotor. You have a critical rotor and a critical drive system, just like you do on traditional aircraft. So you assume that that failure is extremely improbable. And you test, and you show through already accepted means of compliance that, that that's acceptable. <clears throat> now we look at the structural failure and loss of speed control. In case two, we're handling those with the critical systems. I'm saying it's a critical rotor. It's more than just the rotor system. It's the control system and the drive system, right, is critical. In case one, there's not, to me, a clear means of compliance for those failure modes. Now, I'm not saying that that's completely impossible for any aircraft. There are maybe conceivable aircraft out there that you could go and test that to show that it's acceptable. But for a lot of the configurations that are out there today, that we've analyzed, that's not a realistic option. And then finally, we look at our power rating, which we just went through, which is that 2.2x for the case one and versus a 1.3x for case two. Again, that comes back to the practicality of how you're actually going to size your propulsion system and what that means from a weight and cost standpoint. <clears throat> and what we see is that this critical rotor system design, one, has the, the potential to be lighter because of the power requirements, and two, addresses the safety requirements and is aligned with what's in CSVTOL associated to meeting the 10 to the minus 9 requirements for, catas for catastrophic failures, um, which opens the door, essentially, to come back and look at VTOL aircraft that have critical rotors and redundant propulsion. And the answer is, there's a lot of them out there. They look like helicopters. They look like tilt rotors. They don't have to be helicopters or tilt rotors. They could be other vehicles. Um, Bell, obviously, we're interested in ducted fan aircraft. We flew Bell X-22 in the 60s all the way through the 80s. <clears throat> Where I'm going with this is that electric propulsion and distributed electric propulsion opens a lot of doors for us. And I think it's a really key stepping stone to achieve the metrics that we want to achieve in the industry. However, it's not the simple answer alone that's going to unlock all these different vehicles that are all going to be acceptable. I think we need to go back and look at what has historically been accepted solutions for us and understand how we can take the appropriate steps to design vehicles that are not only meet the mission, meet the requirements, but are also safe and certifiable. With that, thank you very much. Appreciate it.